magic has fled the world. But not completely. It has taken refuge in the few places remaining where it can still thrive. Orkney is one such place. A place where in winter, a black cloak of darkness almost constantly covers the islands and the Orcadian people are gathered around their fires to pass the long nights with song and story. Beyond Britannia, where the endless ocean opens, lies Orkney. Orosius, 5th century AD. The Orkney Islands lie off the northern tip of Scotland, where the North Sea and the Atlantic Ocean meet. Orkney is made up of roughly 70 islands, of which only 16 are inhabited by around 22,000 Orcadians. The principal island is simply referred to as the mainland, a corruption of the Old Norse, Meginland. The Orkney Islands have a long and colourful history. It's no exaggeration to say that the Isles are a place where this history remains a part of everyday life. Every corner of the islands has its ancient monuments that stand as constant reminders of the events and people that have gone before. For thousands of years, people have lived and worked in Orkney, from the Stone Age Orcadians who left a legacy of monuments that continue to inspire today, through to the Vikings who took the islands in the 9th century and made them the centre of a powerful earldom and part of the Kingdom of Norway and beyond. Houses and tombs dating back 5,000 years share the landscape with Bronze Age cemeteries, standing stones, 2,000-year-old brocks, Viking ruins, medieval churches and Renaissance palaces. A huge spectrum of cultures which can be experienced alongside each other in these monuments still standing today. An expert on the history and the tales of the island is Lynn Barber a Master of Arts graduate in English Literature and Language and Drama from Glasgow University. For many years, Lynn researched and dramatised the folklore. From her passion for the environment of the Orkney Islands emerged the Orkney Folklore and Storytelling Centre, where she creates folk art experiences and performances. Here on Orkney, we cannot separate the social customs and work traditions from the myths legends, folk tales, rhymes and song dances that weave through the ancient oral traditions passed from generation to generation of islanders who worked the land and fished the seas. Orkney's history and heritage can be found everywhere on the islands, an intricate tapestry of events stitched into the very fabric of the islands themselves. Orcadians have a connection with this history, Events that were witnessed by their ancestors many generations ago. The past is alive and remains part of everyday life, albeit unconsciously. The Orkney imagination is haunted by time. George Mackay Brown Given the mystical, almost dreamlike landscape of the Orkney Islands, with the standing stones, ancient ruins, burial mounds and spectacular scenery, all hemmed in by the invisible walls of a raging sea, it is not surprising that the islands have such a rich and varied folklore. A folklore that was able to develop and spread around the winter flames. The ancient beliefs on the Orkney Islands were all passed down by word of mouth in the oral living traditions through at least three languages. Pictish, Norse and Scots beliefs and customs were woven intricately over hundreds of years. And that is why it is such a challenge to pass these stories on in a way they were meant to be told. For example, an original ballad was told in five fits and 93 verses. In old times, this was no problem, because people would gather around the big peat fire night after night, and the storytellers could simply continue the ballad. 
Throughout time, story is one of man's oldest tools for communication, learning and the recording of individuals and their community's way of life. Stories, customs and beliefs passed on by word of mouth from one generation to the next, the stories of the ordinary and the extraordinary, the great kings and the little people, the magic and the monsters, the shadow and the light. Storytellers have passed on myths and legends in their own dialect since time began. In Orkney, the island's old language, Norn, was superseded by the Scots' Miller tongue. Eventually lost as a spoken language, only fragments of many old Orkney ballads and folktales remain. One ballad still exists as complete piece in Orkney dialect today, the Ballad of Lady Ordevere. Many of the older generation of peoples in peripheral island communities who remember their fathers and mothers and grandparents actually living out and working through these old traditions and beliefs are now, sadly, passing away. Their lives were actually intrinsically woven into the natural cycle of the seasons, and their methods and tools of living with these cycles were so often never written down. Their knowledge and wisdom was often gleaned by sitting around the fires listening to these old legends and myths and folk tales. The Orkney coastline, lashed by furious storms and shrouded by frequent mists, formed the origin of many old and curious legends. The sea provided storytellers with an ever-present but unknown realm, with its storms, whirlpools, riptides, skerries, stacks and caves, the magical realm of the ocean has been a constant source of fascination to Orcadians for centuries. They knew well enough that the sea was fickle, as quick to anger as it was to return to glassy calm. What it provided generously one day, it would callously and without remorse take away the next. Faced with these elements, the ancient Orcadian imagination soon populated the unknown domain with a plethora of supernatural inhabitants. The menacing Finn man, who wouldn't think twice about stealing away a mortal woman to become his bride. The alluring mermaid, whose goal it was to entice a husband beneath the waves. The seductive selkie man, the thieving sea trout, sea serpents and monsters, all were said to have their homes in the waters surrounding Orkney. But above all, these creatures provided the islanders with answers for events they could not comprehend, and convenient explanations for the events that affected their lives. When, for example, a man was lost at sea, he had surely been taken by the Finman, or perhaps tempted away by a mesmerizing mermaid. These explanations may also have offered grieving kin some form of consolation. Perhaps now, they could clutch tightly to the last glimmer of hope that he would return again one day. But this lord is in danger of disappearing. The children of Orkney are no longer told the tales, so cannot, in turn, pass them on to future generations. The Orkney Folklore and Storytelling Centre has made its aim to protect, conserve and present those traditional stories alongside the social customs and heritage of the Orkney crofting, fishing and farming people who have lived on these islands over many centuries. The enchanting tongues went on and on beside the fish oil lamps. Then, the grey of morning entered the crofts and called the islanders back once more to their hard work of ploughing and fishing. George Mackay Brown The Selkie That Jude Not Forget A long time ago, Magnus Mua was gathering limpets on the shore, on the west side of Haxness, in Sandy, when he was puzzled to hear from some place among the rocks 
a very curious sound. Sometimes it was like a person groaning with pain. And then it would become a loud sound like the roaring of a dying cow. And then again, the sound would die away to a low and most pitiful moan as if it were a person completely exhausted after a bout of childbearing pain. The sound was so extremely pitiful that it made Magnus uneasy. Magnus could see nothing for a little while, except a large seal quite near the rocks, thrusting its head above the surface of the water and looking with both eyes into an inlet a short distance away. And Magnus noticed that the seal was not afraid. It never dived and never ceased to gaze at the inlet. Magnus crossed over a large rock which lay between him and the place, and there, in a corner of the inlet, he saw a mother seal lying in the throes of her carving pains. It was this seal that made all the bitter moaning and loud bellowing, and the father seal lay in the sea watching his mate in her trouble. Magnus stood and watched her too, and he said it was pitiful to see what the poor dumb animal suffered. And he stood there, a little way off, until she carved two fine seal calves, which were no sooner on the rocks than they took hold of her teats. Magnus thought to himself that the skins of the calves would make him a splendid waistcoat, and he ran to where all three were lying. The poor mother seal rolled over the edge of the rock into the sea, but the two young seals did not have the wit to get away. So, Magnus seized them both. And then, it was wonderful to see the behavior of the mother seal. She was so anxious about her young. She rolled round and round in the sea and beat herself with her paws, like a thing demented. And then she would climb with her forepaws on the rock and gaze into Magnus's face with a look so exceedingly pitiful that to see her would have melted a heart of stone. The father seal was acting in the same way, except that he would not come so close to Magnus. Magnus turned to go away with the two young seals in his arms. They were sucking his jacket as if they were at their mother's breast, when he heard the seal mother give a groan so dismal and hollow, and so like a human being, that it went straight to his heart and quite overcame him. He looked around and saw the mother seal lying on her side, with her head on the rock, and he saw, as certainly as he ever saw anything on earth, tears brimming from both eyes. To see nature working so powerfully in the poor dumb creature was more than he could stand. So, he bent down and placed both the young seals on the rock. The mother took them in her paws and clasped them to her bosom just as if she had been a human mother with a child. And she looked right into Magnus's face. Oh, what a glad look she gave him. It did Magnus good to see her, for that day the seal did everything but speak. Magnus was then a young man and some time afterward he married. And a long time after he was married, when his children had all grown up, he went to stay on the west side of AD. One fine evening, Magnus went to fish for coal fish of an outlying rock. It was an isolated rock that was covered at high tide. You could only walk to it dry shod at low water. The fish wouldn't take for a time, but when the flood tide began, the fishing became so good that Magnus stood and pulled in the fish until he had quite filled his creel. With the fish taking so well, he forgot his eagerness for them, the path he had to take. And when he was ready to go home, he was horrified to discover that the channel between him and the land was covered by the sea. And the water was so deep that it would have gone over his head. Magnus shouted again and again, 
but he was far away from any house and no one heard his cries. The water kept rising, it came above his knees, then over his hips, then up to his armpits, and many a sore sigh he gave, as the water came ever higher and higher to his chin. He shouted until he was hoarse and could shout no more, and then he gave up all hope of life and saw nothing before him but dismal death. As the sea was coming round his neck, and coming now and then in little ripples into his mouth, just as he found the sea beginning to lift him from the rock, something seized him by the collar of his jacket and swung him off his feet. He had no idea what it was or where he was until he found his feet on the bottom where he could wade in safety to the shore. And when the creature that had hold of him let go, he waded to the dry land. He looked towards the place from whence he had come and saw a large seal swimming to the rock where she dived, took up his creel of fish and swam with it to the land. He waded out and took the creel full of fish out of her mouth. And he said with all his heart, God bless the seal that does not forget. And she looked at him as if she would have said, could she have spoken, one good turn deserves another. He said he would have known her motherly look among a thousand, but she had grown very large and old. So that was the seal that did not forget. The Storytellers of Orkney, a radio feature by Nico Schreiner.